Hello everyone. So this month's education topic is psychopharmacology for the psychiatric nurse. So there are different types of neurotransmitters in our brain. Uh, these are some of them. So we have adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, acetylcholine, glutamate, and endorphins. And this is what they do. So we know adrenaline is our fight or flight. Noradrenaline is our concentration, dopamine is our pleasure, serotonin is our mood, GABA is calming, acetylcholine is learning, glutamate is memory, and endorphins are euphoria. And we will see how this relates to psychopharmacology during this lecture. So there are three rules of neurotransmission. So one is what goes up must come down. The inverse is what goes down must come up. So, for example, if we're adding a stimulant like cocaine or amphetamines, the patient goes from their baseline into a intoxication that is high, right? A stimulate cocaine, amphetamines, amping them up. However, when they go into withdrawal, we then need to watch for um, the them coming down. So they're going to be sedated, lethargic, things like that and then they'll come back up to baseline. When we're adding a depressant like a benzodiazepine, we will see intoxication as being sedated, relaxed, calm. However, when they're withdrawing, they are going to go the opposite way, and that's why we have a risk for seizures um, and things like that because they're getting amped up when they withdraw. So the second rule is that neurotransmitters are not easily fooled. And they do this in two ways, by upregulation and downregulation. So upregulation is when you give a drug that decreases a neurotransmitter, the synapse will add receptors for that neurotransmitter, making it more sensitive to that drug. So as we can see, if we gave a drug that decreases neurotransmitters, which are these little yellow things that are floating around, uh, so if we decrease it, then uh, they are going to add more receptors. You can see they're adding on more receptors and therefore making it more sensitive to a drug. Then we can have downregulation. So when you give a drug that increases a neurotransmitter, so we're increasing all of those little yellow dots, the synapse will remove receptors so that the neurotransmitter makes it less sensitive for that drug. So as you can see, we go from a normal amount of neurotransmitters down to only two in this one. So they're, they're getting rid of it. And that is because our body is trying to compensate. And this downregulation and upregulation account for much of what we see in drug tolerance and withdrawal. The third rule of neurotransmission is great power has great responsibility. So many of the most powerful drugs have more severe side effects. So we can't always use the most powerful first. It's best to attempt to treat with the least powerful option that still gives good results. So types of drug effects on neurotransmitters. So this can look a little intimidating, but we're going to go through it. So you can have a full agonist, and a full agonist drug on a neurotransmitter is going to mimic the effects of the neurotransmitter. So it does the same thing. It's a full agonist. It mimics. And in our slides, you're going to see this as a little plus sign. You can then have a partial agonist, which mimics the effect of the neurotransmitter, but only to a certain point, and that will look like this in the slide. So again, it mimics the effects, but then it kind of balances off. Then you can have a neutral antagonist, which this blocks the effect of the neurotransmitter, and you'll see that as a minus sign, and that's just going to keep everything kind of that steady state. Then we can have an inverse agonist, which in the slides will look like this, and causes the opposite effect of the neurotransmitter. So you can see this is the neurotransmitter, and if we're doing an inverse agonist, we're going the opposite way. So let's go through some different neurotransmitters. So first is dopamine, and dopamine um, has an effect on our drive and reward. It's also involved in psychosis. Uh, it's 
involved in Parkinsonianism. That's why sometimes with antipsychotic meds, we see signs that look like Parkinsonianism, which we'll go through all of this um, later. Um, it affects our attention, our motor, our inability, inhibition of prolactin, narcotics affect dopamine, and extrapyramidal motor function. So again, this spells dopamine. Just some ways to remember what that does. Then we have serotonin. So we can remember this with the SE and the N. So it affects our satisfaction, um, our socialness, but it can also be linked to migraines. It leads to decreases in anxiety, decreases in impulsivity, and decreases in sex drive. Um, it affects our erythrocytes. So um, if we are increasing this, we have to watch for bleeding. It also affects uh, nausea and GI motility. So example, Zofran blocks serotonin, and it therefore helps with nausea. So what happens if we have too much serotonin? We can have serotonin syndrome, and this is a big thing that we need to watch for on um, with our psychiatric patients. So we need to look for, um, we can remember this by head, red, and dead. So head, they get headaches, agitation, and confusion. They're red, so they have hyperthermia, hypertonia, sweating, and tachycardia, and dead because mortality is 2 to 12%. That's very high. Um, and you can see some more signs and symptoms for this. So the diaphoresis, agitation, tachycardia, autonomic instability, and hypertensive, diarrhea, and hyperactive bowels. They can have clonus, tremor, and hyperreflexia, and they can have dilated pupils. And those are the signs of serotonin syndrome. So if you have a patient that is taking a medication that is affecting their serotonin levels, like an SSRI, these are things that you should be looking for. So a, another neurotransmitter um, is norepinephrine, and we know this from the flight or fight response, and it's our sympathetic nervous system. Think if you were being chased by a lion. That feeling, that amped up, that is your norepinephrine. And this is all the things that norepinephrine affects, so centrally it affects your concentration, attention, vigilance, energy. If you see a lion out in the wilderness, you are on alert, your attention is there, you have a lot of energy, you're vigilant, that is your norepinephrine. And peripherally, you'll have tachycardia, hypertension, um, increased glucose, and essential organs, all the blood will shunt to the essential organs because it's getting ready for you to fight or flight. All right, then we have glutamate and GABA. So we can remember this, that glutamate is our on switch and GABA is our off switch. So GABA is inhibitory. Think of a boring lecture that just keeps going on and on. He's just gabbing and gabbing and gabbing and it puts you to sleep. Not like this lecture, right? Um, so that's how we can remember GABA. It is relaxation, euphoria, decreased muscle tension, decrease in breathing, and there is a decrease of anxiety and like no seizure activity. So when GABA is going the opposite way, we have to watch for these things. But uh, we'll get into that when we get into withdrawal. But yes, so that's our off switch. Then we have glutamate. So this is our on switch. This is our excitatory. So too much of this can result in seizures. Uh, it is our learning, our memory, and our mating. Then we have histamine, which we can remember from itching and swelling, right? Like allergic responses. But they're also found in the brain and play a role in wakefulness, which is why antihistamines make us sleepy. We then have acetylcholine. We can remember this with the A, C, and H. So it is our autonomic, so our parasympathetic nervous system. So you'll have bradycardia, GI motility, salvation, lacrimation, urination, and sexual arousal. It's the contraction of our muscles, and it also is involved in our hippocampus, so our learning, memory, wakefulness, and attention. 
and too little acetylcholine leads to Alzheimer's disease. This is kind of a funny meme. When acetylcholine reminds you of an embarrassing moment seven years ago, because it's your memory. So what happens when acetylcholine is too low? We can have anticholinergic toxidrone syndrome. So these are all of the different drugs and even plant sources that can cause this. But what we just need to remember is the signs and symptoms. Like how can we detect that something is wrong with our patients? So hyperthermia, blind as a bat, they can't see. They have those dilated pupils again as well. They're confused, dry mouth, urine retention, shaking, grabbing at invisible objects, tachycardia, absent bowel sounds. Their skin is very flushed. Um, and again, they're very hot. All right, so antidepressants. Now we're going to move on to the first drug class that we're going to cover. So one thing to know about antidepressants is people with bipolar disorder who take antidepressants may be at a risk for switching from depression into mania. The, there is a black box warning for many antidepressants that child and adolescent and young adults taking antidepressants are at an increased risk of suicidal ideation and behavior. So serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors, and again, we can know this plus, so right, we're talking about uh, you know, it mimics the same thing that the neurotransmitters do. We're, we're increasing the serotonin. So in, uh, with serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors, they inhibit the transportation on the presympathetic neuron, which usually takes serotonin back up into the cell. Therefore, there's more serotonin in the synapse cleft. So pretty much it is just making more serotonin in this synapse cleft because it's blocking this reuptake inhibitor, which pulls that serotonin back into the cell. So these have less side effects than other antidepressants, but they can take four to six weeks to reach a desired effect. So if you have a patient that just started an SSRI and they're like, I still feel depressed, it's because it can take a month or more to get the desired effect. If they're abruptly stopped, the patients can have discontinuation syndrome. And these are flu-like symptoms, insomnia, nausea, imbalance, sensory disturbances, and hyperarousal. So we want to make sure our patients know to not abruptly stop these medications. So the first SSRI is Prozac or fluoxetine. One important thing to know about this drug is that it has the longest half-life, which is one week. So it has, if it has to be switched to another SSRI carefully because of the long half-life, switching too quickly can lead to serotonin syndrome because you're going to have that drug in your blood for over a week. So, uh, And it can also cause activation leading to nervousness and insomnia. And a typical dose is 20 to 60 milligrams. Then we have Zoloft, which is sertraline, which has harsher GI side effects than other SSRIs, but it can be taken with food to help decrease these side effects. And side effects include nausea, insomnia, somnolence, headache, dry mouth, and sexual dysfunction. And a typical dose is 50 to 200 milligrams a day. Then we have Paxil or paroxetine. This is rapidly absorbed and can result in worse side effects when a patient first starts the drug. Higher levels in the blood stream faster. So they, because it's rapidly absorbed, they have higher levels in their blood. Uh, high risk for sexual dysfunction, weight gain, and discontinuation syndrome because it has a short half life and the typical dose is 20 to 50 milligrams a day. Then we have Celexa. So this has a high tolerability and works for many patients, not many enzyme interactions, but it can elongate the QTC interval at high doses, over 40 milligrams a day for adults or 20 for the elderly. And a typical dose is 20 to 40 milligrams. Then we have Lexapro. 
and this typical dose is 10 to 20 milligrams a day. It's similar to Celexa, but dose is half, and it is the cleanest SSRI in terms of enzyme interactions. And then we have Luvox, which is an old SSRI and only FDA approved for OCD rather than major depressive disorder. And a typical dose is 100 to 300 milligrams per day. So SSRI side effects. So we remember the things that serotonin stands for. And I've highlighted in red the side effects. So you're going to see migraines. You're going to see decreases in sex drive, and you're going to see GI motility such as diarrhea or constipation and nausea and also bleeding. And again, we do not want to abruptly stop. So the next class of antidepressants is serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors. So serotonin is involved in satisfaction and anxiety. We just went over that. And norepinephrine is involved in energy and focus, both of which can be lost in depression. So the first drug in this class is Effexor. So side effects are going to be hypertension, 50 to 100% high risk of developing hypertension. And this is because we're affecting norepinephrine, that fight or flight response. You're also going to see other signs of affecting norepinephrine, like sweating and dry mouth. There's also going to be signs that were similar to our SSRIs because we're affecting serotonin, so that nausea, insomnia, tremors, and sexual dysfunction. And this drug is most commonly associated with discontinuation syndrome. And a typical dose is 75 to 225 milligrams per day. We then have Cymbalta or Duloxetine, which a typical dose is 30 to 120 milligrams a day. It can also be used in patients with fibromyalgia, diabetic neuropathy, and premenstrual symptoms. We then have Remeron, and this typical dose is 15 to 45 milligrams per day. And its mechanism is different. It inhibits the inhibitory input in the sympathetic nervous system, therefore enhances sympathetic output, therefore counteracting some symptoms of depression. And the big thing with this is that it increases appetite, so it's often used in cancer patients and in nursing homes. But it does cause sedation in 50% of patients, so typically it will be given the night before bed. And it is has a significantly lower frequency of GI disturbances, insomnia, or sexual dysfunction, and it has a decrease in nausea. So SNRI side effects. We are going to see those same side effects that we saw with our SSRIs, right, because we're affecting serotonin. We're going to have the migraines, the decreased sex drive, the bleeding, GI motility, and nausea. However, we're now also affecting norepinephrine, our fight or flight. So we're going to see insomnia, anxiety, or agitation, and sweating. And again, we do not want to abruptly stop because we'll get those flu-like symptoms. So now we have norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. We have one drug in this class, which is bupropion or Wellbutrin. And a typical dose is 150 to 300 milligrams a day. So this drug doesn't have any significant serotonergic effects because, right, we have norepinephrine and dopamine. And it increases happiness but does not have sexual side effects and helps stop, and it also helps individuals stop smoking. It's not sedating. It's actually mildly stimulating. So... But it does have a significant side effect, which is that it does lower the seizure threshold. So it is contraindicated in patients with eating disorders that are at risk for electrolyte imbalances. Common side effects are headache, weight loss, dry mouth, trouble sleeping, nausea, dizziness, constipation, fast heartbeat, and sore throat. But usually these improve over the first week or two. 
So now we have serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitors. We can see we're blocking and adding. So the first one is trazodone. So technically, trazodone is an antidepressant. It's less likely than other antidepressants to cause insomnia or sexual side effects and anxiety. But the side effects are drowsiness, nausea, dry mouth, and prioprism, which requires urgent ur urolo urologist intervention. So that's important to know. If our patients present with this, this is something that we need to report, and we need to let them know that if this happens to them, that they need to call and report this. So a typical dose is 50 to 600 milligrams a day, depending on what it's being used for. Then we have tricyclic antidepressants. So these inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, so it increases it. It antagonizing acetylcholine and histamine, and it inhibits sodium and calcium ion channels. And you can see signs for this all below. So we're, we're increasing norepinephrine and serotonin, and we are antagonizing acetylcholine and histamine, and then also inhibiting the sodium and calcium ion channels. And remember rule three, with great power comes great responsibility. These drugs, the tricyclic antidepressants, have many side effects. So these are typically used for treatment-resistant depression that has failed multiple trials. The antihistamine side effects we'll see are sleepiness, drowsiness, and sedation, the blocking of sodium and calcium ion channels can be, make them toxic in an overdose. If somebody does overdose on this, sodium bicarb is the antidote. And also the blocking of sodium and calcium ion channels widens the QTC interval. Then we're also gonna see anticholinergic side effects. So sedation, dizziness, confusion, hallucinations, urine retention, dry throat, dry mouth, constipation, feeling hot, decreased sweating, tachycardia, blurred vision, dried eyes. And we can also see weight gain and they also lower the seizure threshold and we also may see patients with photosensitivity. So these have a lot of side effects. So a type of tricyclic antidepressant is Tofranil. This is the first antidepressant that was ever developed, and it's sometimes used for nocturnal enuresis in children due to the anticholinergic effect, but due to its side effects, it should not be used as first-line treatment. And the typical dose is 10 to 300 milligrams per day. Then we have anaphranil, and this is only FDA approved for OCD and it is the most effective option for OCD, but has the most side effects, so it's not used first line. And the typical dose is 25 to 250 milligrams per day. Then we have Elevil, which is used for depression and chronic pain, like chronic back pain, diabetic neuropathy, or pelvic pain. And the typical dose is 10 to 100 milligrams a day. We also have Pamelor, which is similar to Elevil, um, but has some subtle differences, and the typical dose is 25 to 150 milligrams per day. Then we have monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So these are increasing the serotonin, the norepinephrine, and the dopamine. So they are the most effective, however, they are rarely used due to side effects. With the increased use of ECT, they are not used very often anymore. So side effects, we can see a, this is the big one, a hypertensive crisis due to tyramine found in many foods such as aged wine, cheese, pickled or ferments, soy sauce, processed meats, cured meats, and beers. And what happens is this builds up um, and it causes our blood vessels to constrict. So types of MAOIs are celagiline, um, and this is used for Parkinson's, and then phenylazine, which is used for depression. But again, these are not used often because 
it's very difficult not to eat things with tyramine. All right, so now we are going to talk about antipsychotics. So black box warning for antipsychotics is that elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis treated with antipsychotic drugs are at an increased risk of death. So there are two types of antipsychotics. We have first generation and second generation. So the first generation are called typicals, and they mostly affect dopamine. They're more likely to cause motor or neurological side effects, such as dystonia, akathisia, pseudoparkinsonianism, and tardive dyskinesia. And we can see examples of that below. Uh, and then we have second generation, which affects dopamine and serotonin. So it's good at treating both positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. These are often called atypicals, but they have metabolic side effects. They can have some motor effects as well, but it's mostly metabolic side effects. Um, it elevates glucose, elevates lipids, and increases weight gain. And we can see this below uh, metabolic syndrome. So first generation typical antipsychotics. We have two different classifications. So we have low potency, which extra pyramidal side effects are more common, but there's less anticholinergic activities. And you can see this um, in chlorpromazine. We also have high potency, which has more anticholinergic activity, but less extrapyramidal side effects. And we see this in flufenazine, haldaparidol. So the first generation typical antipsychotic that is low potency is Thorazine. And this is affecting our dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and histamine, and it is an antagonist, so it is reducing all of those. So because of that, the side effects we're going to see are memory impairment, because we're reducing acetylcholine, hypotension, because we're reducing norepinephrine, sedation, because we're reducing histamine, and motor or neurological side effects in MNS, which, because we're reducing dopamine. The long-term use can lead to sediment deposits in the cornea and prolonged QTC interval can happen because of Thorazine, and this is why we need an EKG. So the typical dose is 25 to 200 milligrams a day, but it can get as high as 2 grams a day for mania. We then have Heldol, which is a first-generation typical antipsychotic that is high potency, so we're affecting mostly dopamine. It's much more selective at the D2 receptor than other first-generation typical antipsychotics, and it has less anticholinergic, antihistaminic, and antiadrenergic effects. And because it affects the D2 receptor so strongly, there is a high rate of extrapyramidal side effects such as acute dystonias, akathisia, and akinesia, and it prolongs the QTC interval at high doses or IV. And it's often used for when a patient is acutely psychotic or during restraints, and the typical dose is 2 to 30 milligrams per day. So what do we mean when we talk about QTC prolongation? So you have your cardiac rhythm and the Q interval to the T interval is called, that interval between is called the QT interval. So when this is prolonged, it is stretched out. And the problem with this is that it can turn into what's called torsades de points, which means twisting of the points, and it's an abnormal heart rhythm that can lead to sudden cardiac death. So when we see a QTC greater than 500, it's associated with a two to three-fold higher risk of torsades de point, and each 10 millisecond increase contributes to approximately a 5 to 7% exponential increase in risk. 
So this is what we want to avoid. So let's quickly just review the things that dopamine affects. Drive and reward, psychosis, Parkinsonianism, attention, motor, inhibition of prolactin, narcotics, and extrapyramidal motor function. All right, so antipsychotics inhibit dopamine. So what does this lead to? Our side effects, right? So loss of drive, reduction of psychosis, which that's good. That's what we want. Induce features of Parkinsonianism. So medically induced Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is too little dopamine. And if we are using an antipsychotic to block dopamine, then we are medically inducing Parkinson's disease. Uh, loss of attention, extrapyramidal side effects, hyperprolactemia, which causes enlarged breasts in males, and neuromalignant syndrome, which is life-threatening, and one of the things we need to monitor for. So when we say extrapyramidal side effects, what do we mean? So we, these come from blocking dopamine. So we can have acute dystonias, which appear in hours, and it can be managed with an anticholinergic such as Benadryl 50 milligrams. This is an ocurogyric crisis, so uncontrolled rolling back of the eyes. You can see a picture of that over here, um, where they have facial grimacing, uh, muscle spasms of the tongue, face, neck, and back and can cause the trunk to arch forward and laryngeal spasms. We can also have akesthesia, which appears in days, and this is jitteriness or feeling like they cannot sit still. They may pace, they may have their feet constantly in motion and be restless and have trouble standing still. Uh, they can have akesthesia which appears in weeks, and it's a decrease in voluntary movement, and it can be a pin rolling movement of the hands. And then we can also, and that's also um, called pseudo-Parkinsonianism, so they can have the shuffling gait, the rigidity, the stooped posture, tremors at rest. Um, and then we can have tardive dyskinesia, which can be irreversible, and the risk increases every year on a first-generation antipsychotic. And that's going to look like this image over here where you have protrusion and rolling the tongue, sucking or smacking movements of the lips, chewing motions, facial dyskinesia, and involuntary movements of the body and extremities. So treatment of extrapyramidal side effects, we use cogentin, which is an anticholinergic and anti-Parkinsonian, which affects acetylcholine. We use Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, and this is why we usually give Heldol IM with Benadryl, and Symmetril, which is a dopaminergic agonist. So one of the most important things that we need to be assessing for for patients that are on antipsychotics are neuro leptic malignant syndrome, and this is from a reduction of dopamine. So these patients are going to have confusion, agitation, hyperthermia. Their temperatures can be 105 degrees Fahrenheit or above. They'll have muscular lead pipe rigidity, seizures, and recent antipsychotic use. You can see hyperreflexia greater in the lower extremities, Clonus greater in the lower extremities, increased vowel sounds, they may have diarrhea, they can have tachycardia, diaphoresis, autonomic instability, and can often be hypertensive, and also have dilated pupils. The treatment for this is dantrolene, a muscle reactant, relaxant, or bromocryptine, which is a dopamine agonist, so that would increase dopamine. So antipsychotic medication forms and considerations. So orally, only 40% compliance outpatient. This is why we see repeat people in our uh, treatment centers. Um, they can be dissolvable. This form helps to prevent cheeking and diversion. We have IV, we have IM, we also have IM Depot, which can last for several weeks after the injection. It's important to make sure patients have tried the medication before giving the depot shot. 
once they get the shot, it can last for four weeks. What if they're allergic? So remember, PO before DPO. So if you have a patient that is supposed to be getting uh, a DPO shot, just make sure they have taken the pill form before this. So second generation antipsychotics. These are also called atypicals. They are mostly affect dopamine and serotonin, and they have metabolic side effects. So the first one is called clozaril or clozapine. This, uh, this decreases the dopamine and it uh, increases serotonin, but only to a certain point. Uh, it most effective treatment for schizophrenia, but can cause a granulocytosis, which is a depletion of white blood cells, which can lead to infection and even death, a 1% chance during the first year. It's never a first-line treatment. Patients must fail two antipsychotics. It has a 60% efficacy for those patients if they can tolerate the side effects. So it does work really well for patients that other drugs do not. Um, and the serum level we're looking for is 200 to 700. And a granulocytosis, we're gonna see fever, chills, weakness, sore throat, sores in the mouth, bleeding gums, bone pain, low blood pressure, fast heartbeat, and trouble breathing. And a typical dose can be anywhere from 6.5 to 450 milligrams per day. So the next drug is Zyprexa or Olanzapine, and this is the second most effective after Clozaril, but it does not have the risk of a granulocytosis. It's a great first-line treatment and one of the most used antipsychotics. However, the side effects are weight gain regardless of caloric intake. And the typical dose is 2.5 to 30 milligrams per day. The next drug is Risperdal or Risperdone, which can be less sedating but and can be used in the elderly for this reason. It is affecting norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and histamine, and it's reducing them all. Uh, it has a low risk of extrapyramidal side effects, but a high risk for metabolic syndrome and a higher risk for gynecomastia. And the dose is between 0.25 to 8 milligrams per day. And the label states you can go as high as 16, but it's generally not recommended. Then we have Seroquel, which is similar to Risperdone, but much more sedating. And the typical dose is between 12.5 and 800 milligrams a day. And some patients may require up to 1.2 grams per day. Geodone, this prolongs the QT interval. And the typical dose is 10 to 160 milligrams per day. Then we have Abilify, and this is a new antipsychotic. And as we can see, it um, levels out dopamine and serotonin. It increases it, but only to a certain point. So it's a partial agonist. Um, so it has different effects than other antipsychotics. It does not completely block the dopamine receptors. Instead, it locks them in at 25% stimulation. And this helps for maintenance therapy, but rarely works for an acute psychotic episode. And it can also help with ruminating thoughts. It can often be used to augment an antidepressant. It's not FDA approved as an antidepressant, but it can be used with an antidepressant for the treatment of refractory cases of major depression. And the side effects, um, it's been identified an association between Abilify use and compulsive or uncontrollable urges to engage in sex, gambling, binge eating, and shopping. Uh, and a big side effect for this one is feeling very restless inside. Then we have mood stabilizers. So the first one is lithium. So the mechanism is unknown and it's one of the best drugs for suicidal ideation it's been very well studied and it has a sevenfold decrease in suicide at a therapeutic level, but it has one of the lowest therapeutic indexes, meaning the dose that is therapeutic is also close to the dose which will harm the patient. And it takes time to become effective, one to three weeks. 
So the therapeutic range is 1.0 to 1.5 for acute treatment and 0.6 to 1.2 for chronic therapy. But the toxic levels are when the drug is above two. So it's very close. And nursing implications, um, they have to have an adequate intake of water, which is about 10 to 12 cups a day because if sodium intake is reduced or depleted by the body through sweating, fever, or diuresis, lithium is reabsorbed by the kidneys and there's an increased risk of toxicity. And the dose can be anywhere from 300 milligrams to 1.8 grams per day. The dosing is based off getting the patient to that therapeutic level, blood level. So lithium side effects um, are going to include uh, movement and tremors. So this usually will mean their dose is too high. Nephrotoxicity and nausea. So it will damage the kidneys when concentrated, meaning if the patient's dehydrated. 5% of patients chronically treated with lithium will get renal insufficiency. And lithium can also cause diabetes insipidus, leading to further dehydration. We can also see hypothyroidism or hypotension, so drowsiness, dizziness, and headache. We can have pregnancy problems in polyuria. Um, polyuria tends, uh, leads to weight gain due to extra calories. And we can have QTC prolongation, arrhythmias, and pulse irregularities. So labs on these patients should be lithium levels, electrolytes, creatinine, and BUN, CBC, TSH, thyroid panel, and a pregnancy test. So again, uh, those toxic lithium levels and what we may see. So 1.5 to 2, they may start having blurred vision, ataxia, nausea and vomiting, and severe diarrhea. From 2 to 3.5, they'll have an excessive output of dilute urine, increased tremor, tremors, muscular irritability, psychomotor retardation, and mental confusion. They may also have giddiness. And anything above 3.5, they'll have impaired consciousness, nystagmus, seizures, decrease or no urine output, arrhythmias, and cardiovascular collapse. Then we have Depakote. So this is an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer. We're affecting GABA, we're increasing it, and we're blocking those sodium channels. So um, and we can see that right in the corner. We don't even have to read this. Um, so serum levels are going to be between 50 and 125. Um, and because it increases the amount of GABA, it gives a benzodiazepine sedative effect. Um, Side effects are prolonged bleeding times, life-threatening pancreatitis, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, anorexia, and hepatic necrosis. And common side effects are drowsiness, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, low platelet count, tremors, tiredness, and hair loss. And it is contraindicated in pregnancy. And the typical dose is 500 milligrams to 2.5 grams per day. Then we have Tegatrol. Typical dose is 100 milligrams to 1.2 grams a day, but can go as high as 1.6 grams a day. Um, it inhibits bolted gated sodium channels, which gives it that anticonvulsant properties, and it augments GABA transmission and GABA because GABA helps manage mania. Uh, indications are trigeminal neuralgia, bipolar disorder, and seizures. And side effects are decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. So that's a big one. We need to make sure that our patients know that they need to use some other form of contraceptive if they are taking this medication. And a side effect is that a granulocytosis, so fever, chills, weakness, sore throat, sores in mouth, bleeding gums, bone pain, low blood pressure, fast heartbeat, trouble breathing, risk of mortality is not as high as Clozapine. Then we have Lamictal, and the typical dose is 25 milligrams to 400 milligrams a day. This inhibits bolted gated sodium channels, which gives it the anti-convulsant properties, but it does not affect GABA, so it's better for patients who have bipolar but are not in a depressive episode. 
The side effects that we have to watch for are widespread itchy rash, which occurs in 5 to 10% of all patients. This is common. We should be checking skin for rashes. This can progress to Steven Johnson syndrome, which is a disorder of the skin and mucous membranes that starts with flu-like symptoms for a few days and then progresses to a rash. Painful purple or red rash that spreads and blisters and is a medical emergency. Fluid replacement wound care and eye care are needed for patients that are having Steven Johnson syndrome. And again, we can see this is a normal patient and this is them after getting Stephen Johnson syndrome. So it's pretty serious, but overall Lamictal does have much less side effects than other mood stabilizers. It's just this one big side effect that we really have to watch for and be monitoring. Then we have Trileptal, which is similar to Tegatrol. Uh, it does not reduce mood cycling and bipolar disorder. It does not carry a risk of a granulocytosis, but it does decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives, and it is not a mood stabilizer. It is an anticonvulsant, and the typical dose is 300 milligrams to 2.4 grams per day. Then we have Topamax. This helps with uh, weight loss from 5 to 15 pounds. It's not a mood stabilizer. Side effects are patients stating the world is dulling, um, difficulty finding words, greater risk of kidney stones, risk for metabolic acidosis, and decreases the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. And the typical dose is 25 to 300 milligrams per day. Then we have gabapentin, which is also an anticonvulsant, and it is not FDA approved for treating bipolar. However, it can be used off label. It's often used for neuropathic pain, such as diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and the typical dose is 300 to 900 milligrams per day. Then we have Lyrica, which is similar to gabapentin, and it is used for neuropathic pain, and the typical dose is 100 to 600 milligrams per day. Now we're going to talk about analytics. So analytics, most increase GABA in some way, which leads to calming and relaxation. Uh, they depress the central nervous system, leading to that relaxation, euphoria, decreased muscle tone, decreased breathing, um, no decrease of anxiety, no risk of seizures, um, or reduces the risk of seizures. Um, then we, so these are benzodiazepines, which increase the frequency of opening of the GABA channel, and then barbiturates, which increase the duration of opening of the GABA channel. So one is the benzos are the frequency of opening, barbiturates are the duration of opening. So we can remember from the beginning of this discussion that what goes down must come up. So with benzodiazepines, when you add a depressant like a benzodiazepine, it leads to intoxication where, every, where they're relaxed, they're sedated. However, if it goes down, it must come up. So during withdrawal, the opposite is happening. You're having increased anxiety, insomnia, tremors, seizures, hypertension, and this can even lead to death. So during withdrawal, all of the sedating and anti-anxiety effects get reversed. If discontinued quickly, it results in an imbalance with glutamate, which is excitatory response. It should also always be titrated. Benzo should always be titrated. Rebound anxiety, rebound insomnia, and risk for seizures, and can lead to tolerance and addiction. So there are three categories of benzodiazepines. We have short, medium, and long. So short-acting benzodiazepines have a half-life between 1 and 12 hours. This is the time half of the medication is excreted. It's used for panic attacks and status epilepticus. These medications include um, trizolam, oxalipam, and versed. Then we have medium-acting benzodiazepines with a half-life between 12 and 40 hours. These are used for anxiety, insomnia, and panic disorders. And again, we're affecting GABA because it's a benzo. We're increasing that GABA. These medications are clonopin, Xanax, Ativan, and Restoril. Then we have long-acting benzodiazepines. These are between 40 and 250-hour half-life. 
They're used for chronic pain disorders and alcohol withdrawal. Medications include Valium and Librium. So side effects of benzodiazepines are drowsiness, confusion, lethargy, physical tolerance and psychological dependence, orthostatic hypotension, paradoxical effect. So this is in some patients taking a benzodiazepine, the opposite response can happen. They can have increased in energy. It can, it can um, amp them up. There is also blood dyscaria, so diseases of the blood. We would see fever, sore throat, bruising, malice, and unusual bleeding. If there is a benzodiazepine overdose, the uh, treatment is anoxate or flumen, flumazenil. I don't know how you say it. So let's talk about alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal. So the withdrawal timeline, if a patient is using alcohol or benzodiazepines, it's important to note that the withdrawal is the same. They're both affecting GABA in the brain. So we can see that seizures are a risk between 6 and 72 hours but mostly peaking around that six hour mark. You'll see minor withdrawal for the first 72 hours. You'll see moderate to severe withdrawal up to possibly five or six days. Hallucinations can start around 24 hours and continue possibly over the first week. And we can see delirium tremens starting around 40 hours, really peaking at that 48 hour mark. Um, and then dropping over the next few days, and then will be zero at about two weeks. So what is delirium tremens? It's a clinical condition which comprises symptoms of both delirium and alcohol withdrawal. So you're having a mixture of both, like a presentation of both. It usually develops 48 to 72 hours after cessation of heavy drinking. 2% of patients with alcohol dependence will get DTs. And treatment is usually benzodiazepines, and we will titrate them. All right, so the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment, we use these this to assess patients going through alcohol withdrawal and benzodiazepine withdrawal. It is a mixture of subjective and objective data, which identifies when patients need to be medicated to reduce detox. Again, you're going to make sure you're checking provider orders. Uh, some providers will have a standing protocol. Other patients will have a standing protocol, but then also having PRN medications to cover whatever the CUS score is. But it's important to still be doing these assessments because you can have a patient on a scheduled dose that could possibly be detoxing between schedule. We need to be able to identify that. So in the flow sheets, you'll have your CUA assessment, and you're really just going down and clicking each of these boxes, which will then give you options for each of these. Then you'll add up each of the scores. So, you know, nausea, vomiting, is it mild, intermittent, or constant? You'll select when you get a score, and you do it for all of these criteria. So nausea, vomiting, tactile disturbance, tremors, auditory disturbance, paradoxical sweats, visual disturbance, anxiety, headache, agitation, orientation, and clouding. It will then give you a total CWA score. Um, anything less than 8 is mild withdrawal, 8 to 15 is moderate withdrawal, and anything greater than 15 is severe withdrawal. And typically, according to the research, a CWA of 8 or higher needs medication. However, always refer to your provider's order. Then we have Buspar, which is another analytic, but it is not a benzodiazepine. It's used for general anxiety disorder. It does not suppress the central nervous system. Its mechanism of action is unknown. It does not affect GABA, so it does not cause sedation. It has no significant withdrawal effect and has very little addictive potential. It's not used often as the therapeutic effect can take weeks to feel relief, and it has a delayed onset of 10 to 14 days to reduce anxiety. So it's not a good PRN either. Um, and the typical dose is 10 to 60 milligrams per day. 
Then we have Adirax, also called Vistaril or Hydroxazine. Uh, it is an antihistamine, so we are blocking histamine, as well as an analytic. It's similar to Benadryl. It's used for anxiety, but also allergic reactions or nausea. It has a low affinity for mucinic, which is acetylcholine receptors, so it has very little anticholinergic side effects, whereas Benadryl has a very high anticholinergic side effects. But we still do see some side effects of dry mouth and drowsiness, and a typical dose will be between 25 milligrams and 400 milligrams per day. Then we have sedatives. So the first is Benadryl, uh, which we just sort of talked about. A typical dose is 25 to 300 milligrams a day. It's a first generation antihistamine available over the counter. Blocks both histamine and acetylcholine, so it does have anticholinergic side effects, so we need to be careful when using this in the elderly. And it's used to treat extrapyramidal side effects of the antipsychotics. And we can just see um, anticholinergic side effects, that blurred vision, tachycardia, feeling hot, decreased sweating, dry throat, dry mouth, constipation, urine retention, sedation, dizziness, confusion, and hallucinations. Then we have Restoril. So risk this is a risk of next day impairment, um, dependence, or hab habituation used when alternative safer therapies for insomnia have failed. It's a benzodiazepine, but used for mostly sleep and not anxiety. The average dose, the typical dose is 7.5 milligrams to 30 milligrams per day. We have Unisom, which is a first-generation antihistamine available over-the-counter. It's the best to treat insomnia. It helps to get to sleep, but they do not provide a good quality of sleep. And there is a tolerance after three days. They do not help you to fall asleep after that. And the typical dose is 25 milligrams per day. Then we have Ambien, which a typical dose is 5 milligrams to 12.5 milligrams per day. Uh, it is a non-benzodiazepine hypnotic, which modulates the GABA receptor, but differently than a benzodiazepine. However, its side effects are interrograde amnesia, so you forget what happens for a few hours after you take it. Also, people report sleepwalking and even driving their car. Then we have Lunesta, which is 1 to 3 milligrams per day, and that is similar to Ambien. So now we'll talk briefly about opioids and we're only gonna cover what you'll see on the floors in the inpatient unit for psych. So just to compare how the potency of fentanyl compares with other opioids. So we can see that morphine, one time square of morphine is just is similar to hydrocodone. Uh, Methadone is three times stronger. Heroin is two to five times stronger. And then fentanyl is 50 to 100 times stronger. So just to give an idea of how strong fentanyl is. So how we'll see fentanyl in the units is really only in a transdermal patch um, for a long-term pain control. We wanna make sure we're wearing gloves when applying or removing. And fentanyl is a high fat solubility, so it crosses the blood brain barrier and penetrates into the central nervous system. We'll also see methadone, which is used for addiction due to its long half life of two to three days, and it helps promote abstinence. We can, uh, in withdrawal, the typical dose is going to be from titration up to 40 milligrams a day. And in addiction maintenance, the usual range is between 60 to 120 milligrams per day, but patients do fall outside of that range sometimes. Then we have Suboxone. So this is used for addiction due to having a high affinity for the opioid receptor, meaning it's attracted to it while having a low activity. So it's only a partial agonist. So remember the partial agonist will increase, but only to a certain point and then it will kind of level out. And we can see that in this picture down here. We can see a full agonist locks into that neurotransmitter perfectly 
to really activate it. But when you have something that's just a partial agonist, like this yellow, which is the Suboxone, it's an imperfect fit. So it has, it doesn't activate as intensely. Um, and there's a much less possibility for abuse or dependence. In nursing practice, a patient should have a cow score greater than eight before the first dose of Suboxone. If not scoring high enough, the patient will experience precipitated withdrawal. And what this means is the Suboxone will go in, these little yellow parts will go in and pop this green part off the receptor and really throw the patient into withdrawal. And this again is for the first dose if they have not been on Suboxone and this is their first dose of it after they've been using. We want to make sure that they're detoxing at least at an eight. But again, always follow your provider's order. When giving them Suboxone, it's a translingual or sublingual film and it can take five to ten minutes to dissolve. So the patient should remain in view of the nurse while uh, the dissolving process happens. Um, if the sublingual dose is swallowed, the patient will receive minimal relief from the withdrawal symptoms. And we want to reassess no less than 60 minutes following the dissolving of Suboxone um, to make sure they're having some symptom relief. So this is in EPIC. This is our COWS. Uh, scale, so our clinical opioid withdrawal scale. And like the CIWA, you are just going down and doing an assessment. So you'll click on the box and then you will answer the question uh, depending on how the patient presents. Um, once you get to the bottom, you will get a total score. It's also important to know that Anxiety is part of the detox and restlessness. Um, these patients for both CWA and cows can be very uncomfortable. So, you know, we want to make sure we're scoring appropriately. And again, subjective and objective data identifies when patients need to be medicated to reduce detox. So usually is in the form of clonidine, suboxone, or methadone. And also remember comfort medications. The prescribers will usually prescribe meds to help with upset stomach or pain relief um, or nausea. And if they don't have those meds on board, that's definitely something to talk to the prescriber about because we want to help these patients be comfortable. This is not a fun experience. So then stimulants and non-stimulants. So ADHD treatment with stimulants. So central nervous stimulation by serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. It does, they do have a potential for abuse stimulants. Their side effects are growth restriction because dopaminergic agents may decrease growth hormone release, stomach pain, loss of appetite, weight loss, mood changes, feeling nervous, fast heart rate, headache, dizziness, sleep problems like insomnia, dry mouth, and ticks or nail biting. And these are all FDA-approved stimulant medications. These are a list of them. Stimulants are affecting the serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. We then have non-stimulant ADHD treatment. So Strata, um, the typical dose is 40 milligrams to 100 milligrams a day. It's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Its side effects are upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite, constipation, dry mouth, um, headache, feeling sleepy, sluggish, or weak during the day, trouble sleeping at night, increased blood pressure, tachycardia, decreased libido, or sexual side effects. Then we also have clonidine. This is going to be an alpha-2 receptor agonist. Uh, the side effects are sleepiness, drowsiness, dizziness, headache, irritability, low blood pressure, nausea, stomach pain, dry mouth, constipation, decreased appetite. And nursing implications are to monitor blood pressure before administering and never abruptly stop because you can have rebound hypotension. And clonidine should have careful dosing. Usually the dose is 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 milligrams. Always question a dose higher than 0 0.1 milligrams in children. Uh, we can also sometimes have for non-stimulant ADHD tr treatment is guanfacine as well. So anti-dementia agents. So these slow the progression but do not reverse the disease. So they work best if used early 
in the diagnoses. So Alzheimer's disease happens when acetylcholine is low. So there's two, so one of the drug classes is cholinesterase inhibitors. So this enzyme breaks down acetylcholine. So this drug inhibits this enzyme, therefore increasing acetylcholine. As the disease progresses, the drug benefits are lost as the brain stops producing acetylcholine. So cholinesterase inhibitors, here are three, Razidine, Aricept, and Exelon. And the side effects we're gonna look for with this because they're all increasing acetylcholine are extraocular muscle weakness, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, um, bradycardia, tachyarrhythmia, arterial hypertension, wheezing, abdominal cramps, um, slowed, uh, shallow breathing, generalized weakness, upper airway obstruction, dysphagia. And the last type of anti-dementia agent is called Namenda. A typical dose is 5 to 20 milligrams a day. This acts on glutamate by reducing it, reducing serotonin, reducing acetylcholine. Um, it does not directly act on acetylcholine. Alzheimer's disease is believed to be caused by overstimulation of glutamate, the primary excitatory amino acid in the central nervous system, resulting in excitotoxicity in neuronal degeneration. So the mechanism of action is to reduce, also called an antagonist of glutamate, also an antagonist of serotonin and nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So pretty much it helps with memories. It can be combined with cholinesterase inhibitors, but the side effects are dizziness, confusion, vomiting, urinary incontinence, headache, rapid weight gain, changes in heart rate, and tingling of hands or feet. And those are our references. Thanks.